Good evening, I'm Mike Haas. And I'm Karen Swenson. Tonight, we begin 10 days of coverage marking the anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. The images you'll see in a moment are raw. They're images we shared as we saw them. WWL-TV stayed on the air the entire time, providing continuous coverage of the storm from its approach to its aftermath. Over the next week, we will talk about the progress made, but tonight, we start at the beginning. For those who lived through Katrina, time has been measured by it ever since. There was life before the storm, and life after. It's a period of time that forever changed the region. It would bring us to untold depths. This is holy, holy hell. Only to reveal an immeasurable tower of strength. We're going to be fine. We have our faith, thank God for that. We're going to make it. We're going to be all right. Going back to those first days is a journey many would rather not take. It's been 10 years, time to move on, they say. But to truly appreciate the progress, reflection is critical. And to ensure that mistakes are never repeated, we must never forget. Tonight, we remember Katrina, the first 10 days. A monster Category 3 storm and possibly taking aim at southeast Louisiana. Hurricane Katrina continues to move west in the Gulf of Mexico. It's Saturday, August 27th. Katrina had just taken a surprise 150-mile turn to the west. She was no longer a Florida panhandle concern. She was ours. Only many either didn't know or didn't appreciate the gravity of the ship. The night before, when the update came out, all eyes were on the Saints. The dome was packed for a preseason game by fans who would all too soon be replaced by evacuees in the refuge of last resort. Again, we're not trying to frighten people, but no, this is one no. that, that we are, quite frankly, very frightened of. We're, we're concerned. By noon Saturday, the region was already within the 48-hour window needed to evacuate the area. We recommend everyone in St. Bernard Parish, if they're going to evacuate, to evacuate now. The message was the same everywhere. Louisianians were well familiar with the drill. Pack up, board up, and get out. Only this time would be different. It would be no drill. I've lived here for over 20 years, and this is really the first time I've been very, very concerned about uh, what the outcome is going to be. This was the clock that was given to my mother and dad for their wedding. In the Eden Isles neighborhood, which sits on the water in Slidell, Carol Hogson takes more than she usually does, an heirloom. I usually won't go. I like to stay. This one does seem to worry me, and I don't know why. It's maybe just a feeling in the air. 1 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, 135 mile per hour winds, pretty much due south of the mouth of the river. By 7 p.m., the track has gone from bad to worse, a possible direct hit. Voluntary evacuation orders are quickly becoming mandatory. So no tolls being cut on the bridge. Tolls are lifted, and police direct all traffic out of town. The contraflow seems to be working, unlike that horrible evacuation the scenario we had during Hurricane Ivan a year ago. Traffic is flowing freely here on the I-10. But that just means not enough people are leaving yet. All right, Mr. Roussel, do you have a sense of uh, how many people have evacuated? So uh, I would say 50 percent. There are similar concerns on the Gulf Coast. Some of these people just aren't thinking back to how devastating some of these hurricanes can be. And this was no ordinary hurricane. Katrina was inhaling the warm Gulf air, inflating herself into the size of a monster. We have not had a direct hit of this magnitude, and so people need to be very, very conscious of the way the storm moves. By 10 o'clock, President Bush does something no other president has done. He declares a state of emergency ahead of it. Minutes later, a chilling report from New Orleans Mayor Ray Nagin. We are joined now by Mayor Ray Nagin. We thank you so much for being here. I understand you just got off the phone with the National Hurricane Center. I called him. He said, Mr. Mayor, I've been in this business 33 years. This is the real deal. He said, this is the storm that everybody has feared for New Orleans for many, many years. New Orleanians would sleep little that night, having been warned repeatedly about the nightmare to come. Sunday, August 28th, just after midnight, Chief Meteorologist Carl Arredondo measures Katrina's growing strength. Here's the winds we're looking at, 7 o'clock in the morning, 
very strong, intense hurricane force winds. The latest models predict landfall in about 31 hours. In the dead of night, the biggest evacuation in the nation's history is underway. And so if you're out there watching and, and, and you are making preparations to leave, you know, it's been a long day. It's going to be a long night. Prepare yourself. The left lane, again, is starting to back up. It looks like a lot of people heeded the mayor's advice. A lot, but not enough, given what's coming. 145 miles an hour, that's what uh, Andrew was when it hit uh, South Florida. Absolutely, and, and, and you know, we, we anticipate that wherever this goes, it can cause that kind of damage. It's now 2 a.m. The latest update confirms a monster. Fill in meteorologist Bill Capo's face delivers the news before his lips do. Uh, what can you tell us about the latest of Katrina, Bill? Well, it's not good news. More bad news keeps coming in. The storm is a confirmed Category 4. However, we're stressing that anybody that can leave, please do so now while the traffic is light. From dawn until dusk, the story is the exodus. Getting out is no longer an option. It's mandatory. Well, it's pretty, it's pretty desperate now. You know, the storms kind of snuck up on everybody, and we really weren't expecting this. Small towns morph into ghost towns as a flood of evacuees spills onto the interstates. We kind of expected New Orleans to get hit soon, but by the mayor um, doing the mandatory evacuation. And as day fades into night, hope of evading the storm does too. The time to evacuate has passed. It's now time to brace for Katrina. So either way, we're going to have an impact. Just a matter of how direct will it be. It's 9 p.m. and landfall is about 10 hours away. The first vans have reached the city. The wind and rain are picking up. A curfew is now in place in Harrison County, 9 o'clock. They don't want anybody to go anywhere. Meanwhile, in New Orleans, the only place to go for those with no place else to go is the Superdome. Got here for three hours. Are you serious? Three hours? Three hours, and we're soaking wet. What do you think about this? It's horrible. Behind the scenes at WWL, the staff splits. Enacting our hurricane coverage plan, half stay in the city and half move to Baton Rouge to report out of LSU's Manship School of Mass Communications when it becomes too unsafe to do so from the city. Eric Paulson, Sally Ann Roberts, and Bill Capo will soon take over. I, we never thought we would see, not in our lifetime, but it no. is something that appears to, we seem to still be in the crosshairs. 13 minutes later, the 10 p.m. track reveals Katrina is now a Category 5. The strongest buildings are thought to be able to withstand a 3. In Kenner, people huddle in the hallways of Bonneville High School. It's been hard. It's been hard, and if it does come, what's going to happen? We may not even have nothing to go back to. We don't know what's going to happen, but like I said, we've got a lot to be thankful for. The good Lord takes care of us. Tan Trung has just returned from area shelters. There is little left to do but hope. But tonight, I think, as we're waiting for this storm, uh, people are really uh, praying. And, and, you know, they're relying on their faith tonight to carry them through. Little did they know how that faith would be tested. It's 11 p.m. The storm has become strong enough that it's no longer safe to report from the station. Along with city leaders, we retreat to the Hyatt for safety, which hours later will look like this. It's Monday, August 29th. The rain is picking up and you can see these definitive bands now. The day that will change life as we know it surprisingly starts with some good news. Some positive, uh, some improving news. For Katrina is losing a little steam. The wind out of the northeast at 44 miles per hour sustained but gusting to 56. So that's actually the wind speed has dropped a little bit over the last hour. And there's more. Katrina may be shifting too. But there's no sigh of relief. Instead, the whole region is now holding its breath especially those on the Gulf Coast. And they know this thing is going to come in, it's going to come in hard. But first, she'll swipe the coast of Plaquemines Parish. It's about 3 a.m. Shrimper Kent Frelick videotapes Katrina's arrival from his boat. The wind's blowing here, it's just, it's blowing the tin and, and metal around on that roof like it's just paper. The wind blows at 125 miles an hour before becoming eerily calm. It's in the eye of the storm. A fellow shrimper comes into focus. His boat had capsized, but he was still floating, covered in fuel, trapped in debris, but alive. 
This has just come out from the National Weather Service. A flash flood warning for Orleans Parish. Stay right there, Chancellor. We'll come right back to you. This is a flash flood warning for Orleans Parish. A flash flood warning for Orleans Parish. What has happened is a levee breach has occurred along the industrial canal at Tennessee Street. There are no pictures of the breach, and somehow the enormity of the update is lost. Our crew in New Orleans is focused on the storm currently pounding the Hyatt, where we had taken cover. Right out here is Poydras, and you can see the wind just, just whipping down Poydras hard. These trees have just been getting battered all morning. We would emerge unscathed, but the hotel would not. We can see huge, huge layers of the roof have just been peeled off. Katrina creates a canopy of debris as she cuts through town, scalping the Superdome in the process. Water fills the streets. Melvin James wades through it, feeling safer in the open than he does in his home. You were, you were at your house? Yeah. Is this not too bad? Yeah, the roof blew off. Everybody okay? Well, they got some people hanging in there. The power is knocked out everywhere, and so is communication. No phones, no radios, no way to share information except face-to-face. -face. Our crews fan out to assess the damage, but they can't get to the worst of it because of water, down trees and power lines, and one flat tire after another. What you're looking at now is uh, the bridge house, which is near Britannia. Wow. And you'll Some of the first images we do see are of Uptown. The damage is bad, but nothing like what's to come. The path of Hurricane Katrina came from St. Bernard Parish and made its way through Orleans Parish. We're here on St. Claude Avenue where water right now is inundating the city. And right now we are reporting to you from one of the newsroom offices. By the afternoon, we're back at our Rampart Street station. While our studio is down, the engineering team somehow gets a signal out of our assistant news director's office. Later, we'll return to our set as reporter Jonathan Betts returns from the Lower Ninth Ward. All you see is water, pretty much, and the tops of roofs. Um, and what you hear are people screaming oh. for help. The reality is worse than our collective imagination can concoct. Thousands of people trapped on rooftops and in attics, including the parents of one of our colleagues. But in the midst of despair, we see heroes. Not enough to go around, but their efforts are Herculean. Deprived of sleep, communication, and resources, first responders start a door-to-door -door search and rescue effort. Neighbors save neighbors. And watch to the right of your screen. Unbelievable. Our colleague Chris Merrifield was shooting video of rising water when he wound up racing through it instead to help a trapped driver. Anybody else that you know of? On the West Bank, there is damage but little flooding. From my standpoint and, and our company's standpoint, again, the worst uh, storm damage we've ever seen. 1.7 million people are without power across the region. Across the lake, we learn Slidell is underwater. The storm surge had chased this woman out of her house with only her cat in tow. It started coming up really fast and I almost didn't get out the door. I would have had to try to get in the attic. Didn't have a ladder, so I said I'll walk it out. She is among the lucky. On the South Shore, far more lives hang in the balance. Send a boat! A boat! Rescuers cry that help is on the way, but so very many people need it. The images are chilling. A hand in a window, two men in an attic. The survivors' needs are as staggering as their endurance. We got up this morning and we just went and prayed. And all of a sudden, the water just started rising. As day dissolves into night, a couple shares their escape. Her words and his expression say it all. Uh, we went to the door to check the water, check outside. We went back inside. And in a, in a moment's time, we just said we're going to walk to the door. The water was rising. With no way to reach authorities, they come to us. An exhausted, dejected Mayor Nagin arrives at 10 p.m. You know, my heart is heavy tonight. Uh, I don't have any good news to really share. Instead, uh, he provides perspective. Time, uh... As dire a situation as we had been reporting all day, we had no idea the scope. Our crews couldn't physically get to the hardest hit areas. New Orleans is, uh, is in a state of devastation. Uh, we probably have 80% of our city underwater. Uh, with some sections of our city, the water is as deep as 20 feet. He runs down a list from hell. Bodies are floating in the water, he says. People are trapped on roofs. Gas lines are erupting, fires are breaking, the airports are flooded, the twin spans are gone. 
and somewhere in the litany. We have a serious levee break at the 17th Street Canal. The enormity of the levee breaches is almost too great to comprehend, but won't be for long. The city that is under siege will soon be underwater. Tuesday, August 30th. Day four of our coverage begins with the jolt. The storm, and therefore the worst, was behind us, we thought. We were wrong. We have a, um, a very difficult situation in the city of New Orleans because two drainage canal levees were breached, and water is pouring into the city. A colleague reports the roads that were dry yesterday are flooded today. The water is coming, he warns. Our staff heads to higher ground, much higher. We caravan to the West Bank and set up shop in our transmitter in Gretna. Around 7.30 or so, we got the word that we had better get out of the uh, French Quarter area, our studios in the French Quarter, or we could be trapped by this water. Yeah, I think when many people went to bed last night in this area, right. where there wasn't water, and to wake up to water, and to wake up to rising mm -hmm. water, uh, it was certainly disconcerting. The first aerials revealed the scope of the damage. Oh, my gosh. It's just, it's, it's hard to believe, hard to believe that we're witnessing this kind of thing. Colleagues who've spent decades covering storms convey their shock in unfiltered words. It's been more than 24 hours, and people are still trapped in homes and stranded in streets. They are hot, hungry, and some are growing desperate. It's true, a lot of people taking a lot of things, and it's not just food and water and supplies, but it's electronics, it's whatever. Whatever they can get, as you can see inside this, I think this is a Walgreens on St. Charles, in fact. Similar scenes unfold downtown. With no jail and no way to get them there, police issue warnings to looters, often at gunpoint. Under a growing threat of rising water, martial law is enacted in much of the region. And if you're able to see this, just as I said before, haul ass and get out of town because it's going to get a lot of work before it gets better. FEMA establishes a staging area in a Metairie parking lot. There are search and rescue teams, cadaver dogs, and military meals, but not nearly enough of anything. Sheriff Harley making a, a plea uh, to anybody out there with boats. Uh, they are desperately needed. Black Hawk helicopters fly overhead, but they're involved in rescue missions. The focus is on the living, not the levee breaches. That afternoon, we see the 17th Street Canal for the first time. The breach is 400 feet wide, longer than a football field. Tan Trung has just seen it. This happened somewhere around 10 o'clock yesterday morning, but that the word, because of the lack of communication, nobody could really get that word to anybody else. So the task to repair the breach is colossal. Since 2 p.m., a single helicopter has been dropping sandbags, two at a time. So that helicopter has to go and refuel, and what you're you know, what you're getting now is just a one helicopter mission. The helicopter logs a lot of miles, but gets nowhere. Neighbors in Lakeview begin to fend for themselves and others. Look how tired that dog is. Yeah, that it, dog cannot we don't know how long move. The images are hard to swallow. The levee breach in one unending gulp has drowned entire neighborhoods and an untold number of souls. And the situation for firefighters now is they don't know who is missing, who is who is evacuated, and what these people are telling me, they're tying corpses to the poles. At the I-10-610 split, one of the busiest forks in the interstate is now a bowl and a boat launch. From here, rescuers go out and survivors return. What's the hell, man? A lot of water, all the houses flooding, a lot of people screaming. It was really bad. When I did this morning, I left the house and I swam up to Florida Boulevard. The stories reveal an endurance mentality. The calamity is far from over, as we're about to learn from breaking news in Algiers. Desperation. This is right. Desperation. We're talking about shooting a cop. A looter has just shot a police officer. The video is raw, and so are emotions. Well, an officer uh, came up on it and uh, uh, confronted one of the looters. And another looter came up behind him and apparently shot the officer in the back of the head. Tension seems to rise with the mercury. In the dome where people have been living for three days in the dark, food and water are running out. With no power, no AC, and no working toilets, many opt to endure the triple-digit heat outdoors rather than the stench inside. Uh, yesterday, we had no communication with you guys. 
In Baton Rouge, reporter Mike Ross has just made it back with some of the first pictures out of Slidell. Uh, this is the road that leads to the Highway 11 bridge into the Eden Isles area. The images are growing surreal. Storm survivors who rode it out are now moving out with whatever they can grab, even if it's just life itself. Rooftop rescues are underway on both sides of the lake. We crossed over dozens of downed power lines, and it's very unnerving. A drive through Plaquemines Parish reveals wind and rain damage in Bell Chase and Jesuit Bend. But there's no telling how bad it is farther south. We are now in our search and rescue mode. Everything south of Myrtle Grove is completely underwater. With no communication, it's unclear whether evacuees grasp the extent of their loss. And I guess what we hadn't talked about much is the schools. Where are they going to go? Right. I mean, we have so many schools that are damaged, I'm sure. Across the region, schools have been closed until December or indefinitely. Many people move in with relatives. Unsure when they can return to New Orleans, the entire Carrier clan, eight families in all, moves in with a single sister in Baton Rouge. We have cried, we have hugged each other, we have comforted each other, but we realize that our complete family, all of our families have been wiped out. The reality is settling in. The disaster is nowhere near over. We just got back with interviewing the mayor just within the last, you know, 20, 30 minutes or so, and the situation has definitely gone from bad to worse. Reporter Jonathan Betts says the rising water has knocked out the pump station at the 17th Street Canal. The fear is that without the pumps, flooding that was being controlled will now flow into areas that had not previously flooded. This is the bowl effect that everybody's been talking about. Water is now going to fill the bowl in the city. Water is already filling downtown. And while hundreds still wait to be rescued from rooftops, the mayor has a warning for people in dry areas. Um, but if you do not have that ability, he says, be prepared to go to your roof and to your ceiling. Which is it's Tuesday night, and though no one has slept, a region wonders when the nightmare will end. Did not have to be the worst case scenario. Wednesday, August 31st, begins with a colleague's observation. Katrina may have started as a natural disaster, but she's quickly becoming a man-made one, too. The Corps of Engineers had promised the city that they were bringing in these massive helicopters to drop these large sandbags. Mayor Negan's upset they didn't. We don't know why they didn't, but they did not. Well, it's, it's just absolutely necessary that the Corps get more sandbags in, into that breach. I mean, we've got to stop it some way, somehow. With warnings that a pump failure could lead to more flooding, fixing the breach at the 17th Street Canal is critically important. Yet a colleague had just canoed through it. And other than an Army Corps official being on site, it looked no different than yesterday. For, for people who want to know when the water stops coming in, what can you tell them? Uh, the, 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 real, the real fix will come in when we start getting sandbags coming out of the... Only 10 had been dumped so far. 10. The region needed federal help, and far more than it was getting. And look at this, all these people up on the interstate. Nowhere to go. It's a never-ending stream of neighbors in need. Survivors plucked from rooftops and attics are brought here, where they huddle under the overpass for shade. You can see, in the, here we go. see there's one of the rescue oh, workers, yeah. uh, the mother. Oh, I mean, uh, that baby's been in diapers on a roof for three days oh, my uh, uh, since Monday morning. The survivors are hungry, thirsty, and drawn to a single Salvation Army truck like a magnet. Makeshift medical tents are erected. There's help here. And in the middle of the misery, something we haven't seen in days, a smile. Mayor Nagan assures us more aid is on the way. I am very encouraged this morning. Uh, we had General Honoré to fly in, the 1st Battalion of the Army. The Navy is sending a hospital ship too, which can't come too soon. The hospitals, having lost power and then their generators, have been evacuating the sick by boat. They're taken here to the Pete Maravich Center in Baton Rouge. Across town at the Office of Emergency Operations, reporter Stephanie Regal announces the first plans to evacuate the Superdome. The state has worked out a plan to evacuate the some 23,000 evacuees, in refugees, in the Superdome and transport them primarily by bus to the Houston Astrodome. The weakest will be bused first, followed by the masses. That is when the buses arrive. 
In the meantime, some welcome news about the threat of a second round of flooding that terrified the city the night before. Now we just heard from the state official who said that he thought that, to the best of his knowledge, the waters were actually receding. The city is not flooding again. Good news, obviously, but no one is celebrating. What does that writing say there? And that five... Save five of us. Save five of us, wow. Wow. After two days and two nights, people are still trapped in the initial flood. And though they wave white flags, there's no surrender, none. The people were on a, uh, on a rooftop, they were stuck in the attics. Photographer Willie Wilson has just returned from interviewing survivors from St. Bernard Parish. Dramatic, it's traumatic, it's, 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 I don't know how to explain it. We're all right, me and Ronnie's all right. By the grace of God, I got a story to tell my grandson when I see him. I love you. Thank you so much. I love you too. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a nightmare. Just holy, holy hell. I don't wish that on anybody. They say hurricane. You got to go. We have some brand new video from the uh, from the uh, Gulf Coast, from the Gulfport area. And then the, the first pictures of the Mississippi coast reveal almost nothing is left. No homes. No buildings. No street signs. No way to even identify what was. It's all just gone. What you're looking at there is the Bay St. Louis Bridge. Mm. There's no bridge there. Look carefully. Now we're standing here at the foot of the twin spans, and even you know now it, it's still hard to believe. The twin spans are destroyed too, as is much of Slidell. Here, the storm surge is to blame. Do not come back. As much as you want to come back. The message to people out of town is stay out. It's safer away as those in New Orleans know all too well. They're still trying to get out any way they can. This mother makes the most difficult choice. She leaves to save her daughter, leaving behind her missing 13-year-old son. There are so many separated families across the area. Their pain is palpable. At the convention center, a Darwinian disaster is unfolding, where it appears only the strongest will survive, and even they will bear scars. If my mama die in my house, I'm gonna kill myself. I can't take that. So many tears, and yet amid the horror are acts of heroism and compassion. A little boy clings to his grandmother and the rescuer who will save them both. FEMA's moving supplies and equipment into the hardest hit areas. It's 4 p.m. President Bush in D.C. assures the region help is on the way. But in the meantime, the tension is getting so high and the looting so prevalent, WWL decides to pull its entire crew from New Orleans and head to Baton Rouge for safety. As we drive out that night, we see a caravan of buses headed into the city. And we hope. It ended with a caravan of buses headed into the city. And we hoped that with the turn of the calendar, September would bring the help the region so desperately needed. But as you'll see, the month started with new challenges and one the Gulf South met with grit, determination, and courage. We're coming to you from a new location from our friends at the beautiful facilities here at uh, LPB, WLPB, Louisiana Public Broadcasting. LPB in Baton Rouge is our new home for the next month. On September 1st, New Orleans is facing innumerable challenges. Rescues are still happening all over. And if the levee breaches are not plugged, the city will never drain. And it is arduously slow. What's sad is they've, they have sandbags in there already. You know what I mean? But it's, it's, it's a deep breach. That's the problem. And it's, it's such a deep, a deep breach. breach and so People are being evacuated from the Superdome, but just as many show up each day as are being bussed out. And the lines appear endless. The cries for federal help are arriving, but so much more is needed. 4,700 National Guard's uh, troops were in town last night. Tonight, he said there will be 7,400. And he said tonight there will be 6,000 National Guardsmen in Mississippi. On this day, there is a different battle being waged in Slidell. The water has mostly receded, and people are coming home only to find that more than 15,000 are homeless. Lost the house, too, just, just as they did. There's really, there's really no words to, to say other than you, you start, you start to over. A helpless feeling surrounds many people as there is so much to do, 
and so little to do it with. There's no one from Florida to here that has gas, electricity, even the smallest of the cities just doesn't have anything. Well, how is anybody going to open anything in this? You can't. Nobody can get to it. We are also getting our first look from the ground at devastated Lower Plaquemines Parish and hearing from those who rode it out, some in a trailer in West Point of Lahash, still trembling from the near death experience. I was frightened. What was going through your mind while all that was happening? I thought I was gone. But miraculously, they survive in that trailer with only enough room for their heads between the water and the ceiling. But the water was over the trailer, but yet God had his mercy upon us because we had still uh, up to the curtain rod, up to that. So we just floated on uh, my daughter's uh, toy chest until uh, help arrive. At the Causeway Boulevard I-10 interchange, the steady stream of helicopters carrying rescued people that began a day before continues with no end in sight. Here I find seven children saved from a rooftop in New Orleans East that during the rescue are separated from their mother. Uh, the youngest being this little guy right here who is four months old. Oh my God. And he's got uh, brothers and sisters. Their mother's name was Katrina. They were a little dehydrated, uh, tired and hungry, uh, which they, that was getting taken care of. Look at the smile. See, so I mean, it, it's, they're getting some much needed TLC. Yeah. And we would learn several days later the family was reunited out of state. But not everyone who needs help is out of state. The shelter at Bonneville High School in Kenner is growing. The breezeways are now living rooms and laundry rooms for people from all over the metro area. New Orleans, a region of unique and distinctly different neighborhoods and parishes, is now a singular entity. And whether you lived on St. Bernard Avenue or in St. Bernard Parish, we are all in this one together and thankful to those who made it possible. The police, paramedics, the military people, what you told them was fantastic. And you can just see the amount of debris that is littering the street right now. And that is the beach area. Uh, some of the roads are now impassable. Tom Trung is in Gulfport as people return to see what is left of their homes, their iconic marina, their town. Police here have a different role this Thursday. Here, this military policeman was telling people, you know, with his gun armed right by his side, mm -hmm. that they're going to have to wait at least six hours, six hours, six hours just to get gas. To check their camps, to check their homes. But look at the amount of damage there. We also see the lower end of Jefferson Parish. Bill Capo flying over Elmer's Island and Grand Isle, an area that felt not only Katrina's surge, but some of her strongest winds. Police barricades at the bridge are keeping everyone but homeowners out. Take, take a look at the damage here. Now this is significant damage. This is wind damage. Perhaps the biggest challenge of covering Katrina is that it is us. It is personal. And I got to tell you on a personal note, uh, some friends of mine were rescued in uh, St. Bernard, so it was a good day. Yes. It's going to be a long and hard chapter, but, you know, it's something you have to do. And today, meteorologist Carl Arredondo is traveling back to his home in Slidell and seeing it for the first time. The water moved the refrigerator and tossed furniture around like plastic toys. Yet he has two crystal thermometers still standing on a small table that didn't move an inch. Like life now, hard to explain. You know, this, people from this area are, are not quitters. And, uh, you know, it'll be back. Just take a while. It's been three full days since the 29th, and the calls for more help are getting louder. We won't help. We won't help. And the wave of emotion will turn almost overnight. Friday, September 2nd begins with some positive news, at least for Jefferson Parish, already in the initial stages of letting people come back and check on their homes. We did get some good news from Dr. Maestri that uh, the hospitals in Jefferson Parish are operational. They have been relinked to energy power. But much of the day is spent talking about the rant the night before from Mayor Nagin on WWL Radio with Garland Robinette. Don't tell me 40,000 people are coming here. They're not here. 
It's too doggone late. Now get off your asses and let's do something. And let's fix the biggest crisis in the history of this country. And this is Air Force One a landing. And Nagin's verbal explosion comes just hours before President Bush arrives, first in Mobile and then in New Orleans. And we have video of him here with uh, Mayor Ray Nagin. Where a meeting most likely is taking place to talk a little bit about federal efforts. And the president doesn't talk about Nagin's criticism, but he too points to the dire situation of filling the levee breaches. The mayor has been telling me, not only by telephone, but here in person, how important it is that we get that uh, breach filled and get that pump station up and running. Despite the president's visit, Everything feels different this day. Desperation is becoming anger, and we are hearing it from all corners. I need somebody to get me a cruise boat or some type of boat, a cruise ship, or some kind of ship so I can put my people in some comfort so I can help the people. We have people in the who have lost their families and they have not gotten out of this fight. I didn't know where my dogs were at for two days and we endured. I'm so tired of this, but it's finally almost over. That's it. I don't talk no more. They're still faced with some of the most incredible, incredible, stupid, ignorant regulations by FEMA. They have turned generators away from us. They've turned fuel away from us. Much of New Orleans looks like a militarized zone with thousands of the Louisiana National Guard arriving. Again, though, with a sharply contrasting reception. Some people threw up their hands in the air and screamed, thank you, Jesus. But others swore at the troops, unhappy that it took them days to get there. I was at the rescue staging area at the Causeway I-10 interchange on both Wednesday and Thursday. People were tired and hungry, but relieved and grateful. But just 24 hours later, the once steady stream of buses had ended, and thousands are now standing in the sweltering heat for hours and days, waiting for a way out. State police say this is a, a scene that has gone from bad to worse. They are getting concerned about the security. Those that got out are arriving in shelters like the Houston Astrodome, safe with the basic necessities, but where one burden is lifted, another continues, as the search for the missing is mind-boggling. And now, in its fourth day... Please call us. Please. Love you, Grandpa. Love Thank you, Grandpa. Here we meet Ted and Helene Bro. She gave birth in New Orleans, but the premature baby had to stay behind on a special monitor. But when the hospital evacuated, their nine-day-old baby was out there, somewhere, and it took days to find out where. Somebody finally called us to say he might be at this hospital, and we called him, and he's there. He's there? He's yep, there. He's there. Levee breaks at the London Avenue and Orleans Avenue canals have deepened the floodwaters in Mid-City and Gentilly, some areas we wouldn't see on the ground for days. Communications are still difficult, and now we are watching things happen in the city live on TV. It is surreal. This is part of that fire uh, downtown we were talking about, the, the one that is close to the Windsor Court Hotel. And you can see the flames going right there. This is one of three fires going on in the metro area at this time. The East Bank of New Orleans had no water to fight the fires, so valiant firefighters would pump flood water into tankers and get to them any way possible. And then at the same time, their homes, uh, many of them, have homes that are, are gone or, or badly damaged. While there is less violence and looting this Friday, it is significantly hampering the relief efforts. Louisiana Wildlife and Fisheries is now asking volunteers with boats, so critical in the days after the storm, not to come in and help. The evacuation at Big Charity is stopped twice because of security concerns, and still half of their patients need to be evacuated. But we see a situation in Charity Hospital that is dire, he said, with perhaps 100 patients and 900 staffers who are having to give each other intravenous nutrients just to keep themselves functioning. Oh, my goodness, as people continue to wait in that heat and the sun. The Superdome and now the Convention Center are both secure with food and water. But what the city needs now are buses and fuel to better get them to safety. 
Fuel is a problem outside of New Orleans as well, like these people in St. Charles Parish that survived the storm pretty well, but have no electricity or gas. They told us that they, they had gas and it was coming and now, you know, we sat out here and they said it's actually not gonna come till tomorrow morning. It is a day of conflicting images as the president speaks at the airport of the federal relief effort here or coming outside the fence. A family with all they own in a grocery cart maneuvers down airline highway. This exhausted baby without the energy to sit up sleeps slumped over as people passing stop to offer water and aid. And we end day seven as we began on a positive note. Crews have isolated the breach at the 17th Street Canal. It is not plugged, but if the lake rises, at least the water won't flow through the breach back into the neighborhoods. One step in the right direction of what we now know is a marathon. It's conceivable that uh, we won't be able to pump this out in 30 days. And the term dewatering becomes a part of our everyday vernacular. We've seen it from the air, but now we are getting our first look up close at decimated St. Bernard Parish. Driving here from Paris Road and turning onto West Judge Perez, where water and debris still block the route. No, we have people uh, stranded uh, in their homes. We've got people stranded in boats. The water has drained some, but there are still neighborhoods with 10 to 15 feet of water. The, the destruction uh, is widespread. I don't think one home in this parish uh, was high and dry in this storm. This is the scene at Causeway and I-10, a live picture, and look at this debris. The National Guard rescues are far from over, but the mass unit staging area underneath the Causeway overpass on Saturday, September 3rd, is now empty. Buses and gas. Buses and gas. Buses and gas. So these are live pictures of school buses going uh, down in downtown New Orleans, assuming they're going to the convention center. The pleas by local officials for buses and gas are heated and buses from all points are coming in. But still, thousands sit and wait at the Superdome and Convention Center for a way to get out. Some New Orleans evacuees would end up in Texas, Utah, and Georgia. An emotional city council president, Oliver Thomas, says busloads of evacuees are being turned away from shelters in Baton Rouge because of the color of their skin and where they live. One of the ladies said, if we were lucky, we would have died. Because they can't even take them in their own state. I think it's over. I think the worst is over. But six, five, six days of this is enough. It's enough. I'm a grown man, and I've seen a lot of action, and I can't take it no more. That from an EMS driver in Jefferson Parish as emotions are frayed. This is not a nice place to be right now. We really do look like a primitive country at, at the present time. Parts of Old Metairie and the Airline Highway area are still underwater, and power is weeks away. But the debris has been pushed off the streets, and the parish is preparing to let homeowners come back and visit their homes on Monday morning. But Sheriff Lee is not in favor of that decision. When these people come back, they're going to hamper our cleanup efforts. Our, uh, they're going to they're be that many more people we're going to have to be looking at. And the evacuation after the storm presents a new challenge. More than 150 pets made it to the staging area at the Causeway Interchange, but they aren't allowed on buses. And now they're at the Jefferson Parish Animal Shelter as they work frantically to find them a temporary home and some way to reunite them with their owners. By now, we are getting updates from local, state, and federal officials two or three times a day and learning of the massive battle ahead for the criminal justice system with new people arrested after the storm added to those who were already in jail before it. And the numbers are staggering with seven to 8,000 inmates now scattered throughout the region. FEMA's Mike Brown still has the president's support, 
but is facing a mountain of criticism for how the agency reacted to the storm. Everyone at FEMA agrees that, is un that it is unacceptable to look at the television and see these people. And that includes these two still in the area around the convention center. Her name is Ann. We don't know his, but we are reminded again that amongst the tragedy, there are great moments of compassion. I will not leave here until this woman is on a bus somewhere gone. Who is she? Don't know. Got no idea. But I ain't gonna leave her here to die. Hellish, and that's an understatement. It was a big relief off my heart. The buses that finally arrived earlier Saturday would make the life-saving difference later in the day at the Superdome and Convention Center. And the last of the thousands of people remaining at both places are put onto buses. I just have to be patient and just continue praying to God that he has sent all us through out of this. And one of the last to leave is Ann. It will be okay, okay? I'll get you, I got something to fan you with. Six days after the storm made landfall Monday morning, not all, but most people are finally out of harm's way. But as we will learn, each new day brings a new hurdle. Pray is what we need now. It is sunny and hot Sunday, September 4th, and a beautiful shot of St. Louis Cathedral, an image like any other normal Sunday. But the cathedral is closed, the quarter all but empty, and Mass today is at St. Joseph's in Baton Rouge as we redefine normal. Churches across America are taking up extra offerings for Katrina victims. This is an American tragedy, number one. Uh, it's not just a Louisiana tragedy, and by the way, it's just in its first act. But the next act begins as the last one finished, with federal and local authorities at odds over the next move. The federal government wants to evacuate the city again, clear out whoever is left until the city is clean and dry. We are not going to be able to have people sitting in houses in the city of New Orleans for weeks and months while we dewater and clean this city. But Congressman Bill Jefferson says if you turn off the lights in New Orleans, they may never come back on. The city has to be brought back to life. Let me tell you, I would hate to see a city just darken in a ghost town. It would be terrible. We've got to try to get people back in, in the city. But it is a city underwater. Toxic water, doctors warn, full of gasoline, oil, and chemicals. And the moving timetable to drain it, at least right now, is 36 days. Nearly a week after Katrina, and the water level near the 17th Street Canal remains at the roof line, with fire still burning. Helicopters are refueling in the air to save time with the sandbagging, but it remains a slow process. There are two helicopters making the loop here. They pick up the sandbags here, swing around, drop them off in the breach. From pick up to drop off takes about 90 seconds. The challenge of draining the city feels insurmountable now. Engineers must drive sheet pilings to keep the lake from coming in, clear the debris so water has an avenue out continue to fill the massive hole in the levee wall, and then hope to get the pumps running to pump the city dry. A time-consuming, coordinated mission with everything on the line. There are people still in their houses in Plaquemine, in St. Bernard, in Lakeview, in Uptown that have not been able to get out. The house-to-house -house effort to find people still stuck in their homes by high water is ramping up. The search and rescue graphics spray painted on houses, denoting the rescue team and the number of live and dead bodies found will become a visual reminder of the storm for years to come. The death toll is predicted to be several thousand, possibly as high as 10,000. But right now, no one can say just how many stayed in their homes. Oh, everybody on safe? All right, let's roll. These are members of the Galveston Police Department. Their trucks full of supplies to help the NOPD, a department that's suffering from more than 100 officers walking off their post in the week after the storm. But a vast majority of them stayed, 
battling and overcoming unreal conditions to protect the city. New Orleans cops that are pretty much on their last leg right now, and things like this keep them going. You know what, there's nothing better in the world we can do to help a brother officer out in need. And uh, what we were watching on the news was a disgrace. Mostly the Galveston Police Department brought cases and cases of water. And even though this may look like a lot, the New Orleans police officers say that this will be gone by the end of the night. I think we are starting to turn the corner. But in New Orleans, that corner feels more like a circle. Tomorrow marks one week since the storm made landfall. And on Sunday, September 4th, this feels more like a mirage than reality. Uh, here we're looking at a live shot of an airline drive and uh, Jefferson Parish line where folks are streaming in mm -hmm. to uh, come back and look at the damage to their home. Monday, September 5th. A week after Katrina made landfall, rain greets thousands of Jefferson Parish residents who are now being allowed in for three days to check on their houses. And knowing only what they've seen on TV is agonizing. Trying, very trying. Um, just hanging in there, hoping for the best, just exhausted. In JP, the damage is nearly identical from neighborhood to neighborhood wet carpets, moldy sheetrock, and downed trees. JP officials ask people to clean out the refrigerators of rotten food and bury it in the backyard. They also mandate a strict curfew. So if anybody's out at 6 o'clock tonight, they will be challenged. Street signs, power lines, and tree limbs are the challenge on the other side of the levee wall in Orleans, where the water is receding, but at a pace that is almost unrecognizable. I believe we see the president right there. She president Bush is making his second trip to the Gulf Coast since the storm, as an entire region now awaits a recovery plan. Already $10.5 billion has been appropriated, but that is just the beginning of what is going to be needed to bring back this area. And some are already questioning whether New Orleans should be brought back or bulldozed. It's clearly worth it to me. I grew up in New Orleans and live there here in Metairie now, uh, and I think everybody feels that way, and that's certainly the clear, bold commitment of the president. And Armstrong International, where the president lands, is now a city unto itself. Rescued people are being moved using baggage carts inside a mass unit hospital and a morgue. Just frustrated, absolutely frustrated. Many are sick and injured. Doctors are brought in from across the country, and in just days, thousands are evacuated to safety, and more always arrive. People back home may never understand how many thousands of people are coming through here constantly. It's a constant stream of people. There is some good news. Water is going down a little bit. Across Reporter Jonathan Betts is on Canal Street, where the water from the levee breaches at the 17th Street, London, and Orleans canals still blankets the iconic location. You don't want to leave? You know they're not going to be back for a month, right? You can be by yourself for a month. Everything's good. Uptown, the Oklahoma National Guard is urging those still in their homes to leave. But no one does, not even this 82-year-old man waiting in chest-deep water looking for his wallet. Everything's all right. Everything's all right. Meg Ferris is in past Christiane, Mississippi, and surrounded by devastation, sits St. Paul's Catholic Church. The building is decimated, but the cross and the Virgin Mary statue in front make it through, and the crucifix inside without a scratch. And what amazes rescue workers most, among all this destruction and broken glass, not one piece of stained glass of the Stations of the Cross is broken. From the beaches in Mississippi to those at Grand Isle, locals echo the determination to come back. You're gonna rebuild? Oh yeah, why? That's what we do. Right now, that, that's the one. Richie LeBlanc and Mike Goodrich, strangers before the storm, are now providing ferry service to others in Lakeview who want to see their homes. The only way in is through a second floor window, and the only things salvageable are kept in two bags. Hey, you got your life. Everything's going to be OK. Yeah, that's the main point. It's going to be OK. Just look at that. We see the water being pumped out. 
Look at that water. It's an amazing it. sight. It is. It is what people have so desperately wanted. The water is moving out. It is not the main pump station drawing water out of New Orleans at the 17th Street Canal, but a portable unit draining the closest neighborhood to the wall. This is a great sight for a lot yes. of people. Seven days after Katrina's landfall, it is a small but significant victory because despite all the obstacles that lie ahead, you got to start somewhere. It would be two weeks later when we finally heard the words, the city is dry. The first 10 days were some of the most trying in Louisiana's history, but that just made the past 10 years that much more awe-inspiring in terms of the rebirth. Over the next week, we'll highlight the progress, growth, and resilience that has made the region a global symbol of perseverance and triumph. Good night.